And this video is on chapter one, learning objective number two, describing the primary forms of business organizations. We have three main types of business organizations uh, here in Canada and really applicable to many of the jurisdictions in the world. The first one is proprietorship, uh, which you may also be referred to as sole proprietorship. This is when it's owned by one person, the proprietor. Literally, uh, it is simple to set up because you can just set it up right now. You can go out and take one of your books and go settle it, sell it on Kijiji, and technically you are a sole proprietor. However, if you take a book that you have and you sell it on Kijiji, you're likely not making any money and therefore you're not required to record it on your taxes. Um, so you would have a sole proprietorship if you are making money and then there is a form on your tax return and you are required to set it up. So this is, you know, effectively, there is no separation between yourself and the business. You have full control over the business because it's effectively you and um, it has unlimited liability because you're effectively representing the corporation. Um, well, sorry, it's not a corporation. You're reflecting the organization as yourself. You're selling a book in Kijiji, you're making the money, you are the sole proprietor. You have to pay the income tax. Um, you know, if somebody doesn't like the book, if the book harms somebody, you are on the hook, unlimited liability. Um, the organization lives and dies with you, so it can't extend uh, beyond you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not all bad. Listen, if you're out there selling lemonade, if you are out there and you are, are hustling, you don't have much of a business sense, you just need to go out and make money and support you, yourself, your family, this is not a bad option. However, learning about the other two forms of business organizations can help you really weigh the pros and cons. For example, this is relatively simple to set up and you have control. We're gonna see some other organizations uh, very shortly that are not simple to set up. Um, so pros and cons to everything. Okay, so the second form of business organizations is a partnership. Okay, I will be very transparent here. I am not a fan of partnerships. They have their time and place. For example, certain professions in Canada, such as accountants and lawyers, are not allowed to have the third type of organization, which we'll talk about in just a moment, a corporation. They're not allowed to incorporate. So what they do is they'll have these limited liability partnerships and, um, and some of them will have more unlimited liability, like what we see here. And that's basically because they can't be a corporation, so they form a partnership. There are very limited circumstances where I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. When you're prohibited by law to create an organization, from you, when you're prohibited by law to create a corporation, this may be a good instance. However, if you are like, I want to start a business with my best friend. My best friend has been my best year friend for two years. Let's start a partnership. Well, here's the thing: that partnership is very similar to a sole proprietorship, except that now it's owned by two people, and you have a written agreement. It lives and dies with the partners. So if one of you dies, what happens to the partnership? Well, it might go to the heir. So now you start a partnership with your best friend who's awesome, but what if their heir is their spouse? And, you know, would you have ever gotten into business with their spouse? You know, or what if their heir are their parents? Would you have ever gotten into business with their parents? Well, what if you, you know, had this organization and you were creating craft beer or you were in the cannabis industry or you were in, um, you know, selling reseller of Nike shoes, high tops. Would the partner, pardon me, would your partners, heirs, their parents, their spouses, uh, would they know as much as you know? Or are you now having to carry the partnership for all people? Okay, it gets messy. Then what if your partner um, gets a divorce? Uh, like what if their um, former spouse then gets ownership rights to your partnership? It gets messy. I'm not a fan of partnerships except in very limited instances. I kind of feel like, you know, people will be like, well, if you don't want to be a sole proprietor or you don't want to be a uh, corporation, just do a partnership. It almost feels like a compromise, except it's a compromise where nobody wins. 
Okay, except under very, very limited circumstances. Basically has all the negatives of a sole proprietorship and the negatives of a corporation, uh, which will also include, and something I should have included here, um, it's more complicated for taxes. So you kind of have the bad sides of a partnership, the bad sides of a corporation, and yet <laughs> you're now a partner. All right, so let's look at a corporation. A corporation is its own legal entity. So the owners, um, the share, we call them share owners because uh, the corporation is incorporated and shares are issued. The corporation does not die. It is its own separate legal entity. And the only time it can kind of quote die is if um, you know it is shut down. If you you know sell all the assets and you um, and you end the corporation, but it go can go on indefinitely. And in fact, some corporations here in Canada have been going on pretty much um, indefinitely. For example, here in Canada, the Hudson's Bay Company or HBC is the oldest uh, company in Canada. It was incorporated May 2nd in 1670. Wow. All right. So, <laughs> you know, corporations can go on and on and on and have an indefinite life, at least in theory. Uh, you can raise capital. So if you want to say, um, you know, you want to go out and expand, you know, I have Samantha's wonderful hair care business, um, but I want to buy, I want to set up a brand new shop on the water, the harbor front. Okay. Well, I can sell shares in my corporation, you know, Samantha Hair Corp, and then you get a piece of my business for your investment. And then whenever I make profits, you can get a portion of those profits because you are an investor, you are now a part owner. I can't really do the same with um, my sole proprietorship. So you can raise money. Um, the company is now liable for everything. So Sam's Wonderful Hair Care Corp, uh, you know, gives a bad haircut to a celebrity, the celebrity sues. The celebrity is, if they win, if they are successful in their lawsuit, they are only entitled to the assets of the corporation, but not me personally. Um, there's income tax in the corporation, and then individuals still need to pay income tax. So the, one of the negatives here of um, a corporation is that it's a pain in the butt as far as, you know, you need to effectively have this brand new entity, this, you know, effectively own separate person um, that has their own separate tax return, their own separate accounting, and then once you take money out of the business to pay yourself personally, then you also have uh, income tax um, and other compliance um, items. So you really are kind of almost doubling, if not more, the amount of paperwork and annual filings that you'll need to do. Uh, to further make this a little bit more complicated, and not bad, but the shares, uh, so the ownership certificates of the company, they can be private. So if it was Sam's Wonderful Hair Care Corp, uh, and yes, I realize it's a new hair care corp um, every time, uh, <laughs> if I sell shares to say, Two of my markers, uh, so Brie and Vishu are now um, my shareholders. That is the example of a private company. However, if all of a sudden I am basically like the Chatters Inc. of, <laughs> of Canada, uh, I might do an initial public offering where I sell shares. I'm going to be represented by an investment bank because uh, investment bankers, um, IB people, they're the ones that are wheeling and dealing and valuing my company and then are talking to all like their investment houses and being like, hey, I got, you know, an up and coming IPO. Are you interested? Yeah, this is the price. This is what we're like going for. And, you know, there's an initial public offering to uh, those um, typically uh, those kind of commercial uh, investors, those like camps, and then um, they're now on the market. So they could be on the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture, the Toronto Stock Exchange Regular, the NASDAQ, etc. And that means that people wouldn't even need to kind of discuss with me. They could just uh, sell the shares back and forth, like Apple, like, um, oh my gosh, um, British Petroleum, and like a number of other publicly co uh, traded companies that you'll likely be learning about in your other courses and in this course. All right. Generally accepted accounting principles are often referred to as GAP. Here in Canada, we have two forms of GAAP, which I will be speaking about. The first is international, oops, 
uh, financial reporting standards or IFRS. You may also hear some people refer to this as IFRS. And so these are what our publicly traded corporations must report under. We also have AS Accounting Standards for Private Enterprises, or ASPE. Private corporations may use either IFRS or ASPE. However, those private corporations uh, and sole providers and partnerships tend to pick ASPE because it, it just tends to be simpler. Um, there's, how do I say this? There's a lot of nuances to IFRS, which most of which you will only see in, um, in its senior level accounting courses, such as COM 3111 or COM uh, 3105, definitely the advanced ones, advanced accounting one, uh, 441, oh my gosh, sorry, I teach these, so I should really know. Uh, 4101, I believe, and 4102, uh, so advanced accounting one and advanced accounting two. So in COM or MGMT 1101, or COM MGMT 1102, you won't have to um, worry too, too much about the differences between these two standards, and in general, assume we're talking about ASPE unless we otherwise state. There will be some nuances that are important, and when they are um, typically at the end of the uh, learning objectives for a week, I'll point out the major differences, but what I want you to understand from this is what I've said on this slide, that there's two different reporting standards here in Canada, one being IFRS, the other being ASPE. In general, if you are public, you will use IFRS because you have to, and in general, if you're not public, you won't because it's very onerous um, to report under IFRS. If you don't need to, most times businesses find that the extra work is not worth the extra effort and cost. Okay, time for uh, some practice because learning is repeated exposure to same or similar material. So here we have brief exercise 1.1 and I'm gonna ask for you to kind of come back to our, um, what we covered in that first mini lecture video which is whether or not an item, uh, pardon me, whether or not, um, what would we call this? Whether or not a user is internal or external to a corporation. And we're also gonna see what type of evaluations would this user really care about. Um, on top of it, we can also discuss whether or not um, each one of these would typically be in a partnership, a sole proprietorship, or in a corporation. All right, so I'm gonna ask for you to pause the video, give this one a go, and when we return, I will go over the answers for you. All right. So when looking at this, we see that, oh, nice textbook people have given us the first one. So it, number five is our investor. So this is the person that is wondering, hmm, uh, I'm really interested if the company's net income is increasing, perhaps decreasing, because that will impact the value of my shares uh, and uh, the value of my possible uh, dividends. So this user is external. They are not employees to our uh, organization. They are investing in our organization from the outside. And so what types of organizations could have investors? Well, this is going to be the corporation. So uh, the corporation can have investors. All right, and now looking at the marketing manager. So scanning all the items here, knowing that it's not going to be number five because we've already used that. Our marketing manager really cares if our advertising campaign was cost effective because that's what they're responsible for. Their marketing is their marketing campaign cost effective. And the marketing manager is... Yep, you got it if you said internal. And so can we have a marketing manager uh, in a sole proprietorship, in a partnership, or in a corporation? Well, effectively, yes. We can have a ma uh, marketing manager in each three types of um, uh, business organizations. So all three. All right. 
A creditor. A creditor is going to be most concerned with number one, can the company pay for purchases made on account? So if the company already made the purchases, uh, they already have the inventory, they already have the property plans and equipment, but can they actually pay it back? A creditor is going to be external uh, to the organization. And, um, sorry, I just control F because I had put externals there. Um, and that should be external. Uh, so yeah, they're external. They aren't an employee. They aren't uh, employed by the organization. Rather, they're external and they provided a loan by way of either directly in cash or indirectly through, um, you know, property plans and equipment or inventory or something to that effect. And a creditor is going to be, like I said, external. And there can be a creditor to all three types of organizations. So you can, um, if you're a sole proprietor, if you're in a partnership, or if you are in a corporation, you, <laughs> you could owe money to uh, a creditor if you're in each of the three. Okay, chief financial officer. So a chief financial officer is going to be most concerned with determining if a company should use debt or financing, uh, debt or equity financing. So that's gonna be number six. So debt financing is, hey, I wanna build this plant, um, I'm gonna take out a loan. For the, uh, the corporation's gonna take out a loan, or the organization is gonna take out a loan. And a um, equity is I'm going to um, sell shares and do an equity raise. So the chief financial officer is kind of like the financial leader of the organizational ship. And so while you could say, well, you know, number five could apply, number four could apply, number one could apply, that's because like they're the leader of the ship. But the ship and how it's funded, you know, in a way how it's fueled, that best answer is the chief financial officer because they're the ones responsible for steering the ship. If you take on too much debt, the ship might sink. If you take on too much equity, um, the original owners might not you know, ever see any of the profits because it's gonna be split 500 million ways instead of just like five. So really, number six, determining if the company should use debt or equity financing is most applicable to the chief financial officer. And the chief financial officer is internal. They're employed by the company. Uh, they're an officer of the company. They're right up at the top uh, steering that ship. And so what type of organization would have a chief financial officer? This is a tricky question. And one of the reasons why I integrated this question into our uh, learning objectives one and two question. So typically a CFO, a chief financial officer, could be part of a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or um, a corporation. However, if they're deciding between debt or equity financing, that means this person is gonna be the CFO of a corporation because we can't have uh, equity financing for a sole proprietor or for a partnership. In a partnership, you can buy into the, uh, into the partnership, but that means you're buying in to be a partner. You're reflecting your partnership. Uh, you are not buying equity or are not an investor. So the best answer for here, and a little bit of a tricky one, not a trick question, just a tricky question, uh, is going to be um, a corporation for the CFO who has to decide if uh, the, the company should use um, debt or financing, debt or equity financing. All right, two more, let's see how you're doing. Canada Revenue Agency. The Canada Revenue Agency is, we only have two or three left, they're gonna be most interested in number two, determining if the company has complied with income tax regulations. Canada Revenue Agency wants to make sure that each organization and individual pays their fair amount, um, the prescribed amount, the um, law, <laughs> the amount as indicated by the law, and um, they don't care if you pay more, um, but they absolutely care if you pay less. I shouldn't say they don't care if you pay more, um, because there's been instances that I've heard about where an uh, GST, so an indirect tax auditor will come out from the CRA and actually assess that um, the, the farmer that they happen to be auditing in this one example uh, was paying too much. Um, they had been remitting too much um, and then they end up getting a refund. So the CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, wants to ensure that you're paying the appropriate amount. And 
the CRA is going to be external. So they are an external organization, they represent the government, and they are not part of your everyday internal organizational life. All right, and uh, the types of organizations they're applicable to? All three. So proprietors have to pay income tax, partnerships have to pay income tax, and corporations must pay income tax. All right, last one, process of elimination. Uh, this is gonna be number three. And this is the best one because if a company could afford a 1% salary increase, that is our labor union. Our labor union represents um, the employees or a certain uh, subset of employees and uh, they wanna ensure, hey, if we're gonna be asking, if we're gonna be negotiating for this raise for our members who are uh, employees within the organization, then can the company actually afford to do so? If they can't afford to do so, well, then us trying to negotiate for it might not be helpful. Maybe then instead we should negotiate for things like extra vacation days or other um, non-financial benefits to help motivate or support the employees. And the labor unions, while they support employees in the organization, the labor union itself is actually external to the organization. All right, and labor unions represent employees. Uh, this is a trickier one. Um, it really could apply to all three because you know you might have uh, marketing managers, um, you might have you know CFOs, you might have um, different people that are um, you know being employed by each type, each of the three types of organizations. However, in the news, we typically do hear about it primarily about uh, labor unions for corporations, but in theory, they could apply to all three because all three have employees and employees um, have the right uh, in Canada to vote and to become part of a labor union. All right, so I hope you are doing well. And again, I like right answers. I love wrong answers, especially when you get excited and you're like, oh, close and oh yeah, like that, that's why it's right. Or, hey, I'm not sure if I know that that's actually right. Let's post a question in the discussion board and, uh, and talk it out. Uh, in case you can't tell, uh, I like to talk. So please do post if you wanna talk about this or anything else. And if not, I will see you in the next video.